E-M. All right. So we're launching in to a new series, and we're starting it on July 4th. Kind of an odd time to start it, because I know a lot of you guys have a lot of parties that you're going to and things that you're doing, the celebration for the 4th of July, a lot of you traveling. But I wanted to start this series because, uh, well, I needed to, honestly, for me, and some of the challenges that I face in negativity. And so I, I want to be positive. I know you want to be positive, but I just want to give a little disclaimer here, a little disclaimer before we even get started. If you tend to kind of struggle with negativity or you lean more towards the negative side on some things, this series, I'm just going to give you a warning label. Uh, this could be harmful to your health um, because if you're, especially if you live with somebody who's positive, they're going to hold you accountable through this series. Like my wife, so I've known I'm going to do this series for weeks and weeks now. And so I've been, as I'm preparing for that and thinking about it and talking to her about it and stuff, you know. Every time some little bit of negativity might creep in, I'm reminded of the series that I'm getting ready to speak on. It's like, <clears throat> what's the new series? I'm going, oh, yeah, stay positive. Dang it. You know, who came up with that idea to do that series? Even, even yesterday, so I'm with a couple families in the church, and we're playing, a new, we're playing a new card game. We're sitting around the table. We're playing, and I made a really stupid decision and a stupid mistake, and I, I said, well, that's it. There's absolutely no hope for me in this game. I, there's no way possible I'm going to win. And they said, hey, what's that series that you're starting tomorrow? And I wrote, I am absolutely positive there is no way that I'm going to win <laughs> this game. So I'm just giving you a little disclaimer about that, that, that you know, this, this series could be harmful to your health. If you're on the negative side of things, you might get elbowed here and there. Uh, stay positive, stay positive, stay positive. There are about three things. When I was thinking about this, aside from like circumstantial things that can go on in our life, you know, bad medical diagnosis and those kinds of things, aside from those things, there's about three common primary things, at least in my life, that can cause me uh, to be negative if I'm not careful, if I allow it to creep in. And the first one, I'm just going to kind of give you these three and just a little bit of, of uh, application on that, and then we're going to take a look at God's Word and what God's Word has to say. But the first one is... Social media slash news. Man, social media slash news can really just creep in the negativity into my life. And maybe it can be to you. I'm a news junkie. I, I read everything I can get my hands on uh, about the news. And then what I've actually been hearing about and reading about is about 70 to 80 percent of everything that you read news wise, if not more than that, is based on negative. And so it's a negative slant in order to gain viewership. So it's really not even truly, sometimes not even a truly news. It's about viewership. And so, but they use negativity to draw us to look, clickbait type stuff to be able to click on this or to watch this thing. Because the negativity actually breeds negativity. Negativity actually draws people to negativity. And so I've had to, for me, and the same thing can happen with social media. Some people have claimed that social media's invention is one of the most dangerous things since the invention of the nuclear weapon. I mean, and I, and I can see that. I mean, I can see how it happens in kids' lives, especially. Uh, and I, I know how it even has happened in mine. About seven years ago, I was just consumed with social media, you know, kind of like days of our lives. I'm living somebody else's life here. I'm like looking, looking, I'm spending the whole time looking and seeing what you guys are doing, what everybody else is doing, what all my friends are doing. How many likes did I get on that? Oh, this person didn't like that. What are they doing? Are they unfriended me? Well, I don't know. If they weren't my friend on Facebook, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was like, and it can, can kind of eat, if you're not careful, it can kind of eat away at you a little bit. And I had another pastor, a friend of mine, he challenged me. He said, hey, I did this. He goes, take a Facebook fast for a month. Take a Facebook fast for a month. Don't get on social media for a month. So I put a, a thing on my banner on Facebook. and I said, I'm gone fishing, you know, literally. And, and I said, I'll be back in about a month from now. And I actually never really truly went back, not to, to that level. I still post pictures of grandkids and, you know, and every now and then I'll post something at church or some fish that I caught or something like that. But, you know, like I'm not, I'm not back at that same level at all. And I, don't ever, and I don't ever plan to go back to that same level. So some of you, like I know I hear people doing intermittent fasting. That's a big thing right now, you know. Uh, you should probably do a full fast from social media or a full fast from news. Try it for a week. And you may not even find yourself going back to it because you'll, you'll, be, able to, uh, you'll be able to have a lot more positive because when I see these things or when I read these things, I'm just like, I see the drift of our culture from Judeo-Christian values like Paul was talking about this, this morning during, the, during the, the welcome time. 
you know, sometimes I just, I, I see this news about the person who turned their back on the American flag and all this kind of stuff that's representing our country. And I'm just like, oh, what are we, I'm moving to New Zealand, you know. I've never been to New Zealand, but, you know, and I'm just kind of thinking, oh, my gosh, what, our country's going to, the, going to hell in a handbasket. Have you heard that before, you know, or you said that before, you know. I don't know what, have any clue what that means or why you would go to hell in a handbasket. But, you know, I've kind of said those things, and if I'm just not careful, man, the news can just wipe me out with negativity. So that's one thing. I just would highly, highly encourage that. If that's something that's really creeping into your life, negativity in your life, just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. You don't need it's the same stuff every day. It's the same stuff every day. So I'm going to do a news fast uh, and a social media fast coming up. The second thing that can, you know, be a negative thing for us, cause negativity, are people. Other people. Because if you're around negative people all the time, you know what happens? You become negative. It just happens. Negativity breeds negativity. Negativity is what killed the Israelites. And we see this time and time and time again throughout scriptures, the grumbling of God's people even. And it's not even just those outside the church. It was those inside, you know, inside the kingdom of God, the grumbling and grumbling and grumbling. And God says, oh, good grief. I don't like this grumbling. You know, those of you who are gossiping, those who are grumbling, those who are constantly sowing division, those who are negative all the time. And it caused the Israelites to be defeated. And negativity is like that, man. And if you're a negative person, I, I will run from negative people. I will absolutely run from that. I don't want to fill my time or fill my life with negative people because I know that how much it just breeds negativity. So if you're a negative person, I mean, if you're a negative person in a church, as a pastor, I'm going to love you the best I can. You know, I, I'm going to do my best to minister to you, but I am not asking you to go on vacation with me, you know. <laughs> like, I don't want to be around that. I just do not want to be around that. People are like elevators. They will take you up or they will take you down. That's absolutely true. That is absolutely true. So, so if you find yourself being negative, look at the people that you're hanging out with. And you may have to change. You literally may have to change your group of friends. You may have to change your group of friends. The third one, now this may not be for everybody in the room, but this, one, this one's some, a little bit for me. It is a lot for me. Um, how many of you are worst case scenario thinkers? Raise your hand high. Be proud of it. Your worst case scenario. She's pointing to her husband. Worst case scenario thinkers. <laughs> Oh, let me see again real quick. Sorry. Sorry. I know. You. All right. All right. Worst. A lot more than first service. We didn't have a lot. I felt like I was just talking to myself in first service. But so not all of you are worst case scenario thinkers. Those of you who are not worst case scenario thinkers, like my wife's not, uh, Michelle's not, but you, you, at least maybe you'll just understand us a little bit better. Okay. But this comes from the boy scout in me that always, always, always be prepared, you know, so I want to be prepared for the worst case. So if I go to a restaurant, I'm going to sit in the corner. I'm going to look for my escape routes. I mean, that's just who I am. And, and, I, and I'm vision thing, you know. So if, and like if, you're, if you grew up in my house, like if you're a kid, grew up in my house, it could be like this. And, you know, the power goes off. You're like, I'm like, okay, power's off. North Korea just sailed a ship into the Gulf, fired a high altitude nuclear weapon. We have an EMP strike. Years of devastation and ap apocalyptic, you know, crisis here. All right, you, go fill up all the gas cans. You get the rain barrels out. You start the beef jerky. Let's get this thing going, you know. <laughs> Power comes back on. I'm like, eh, never mind, power's on, you know. <laughs> so that's kind of that's me. I envision, I envision this destruction. I, I, I can envision this, you know, the worst case scenarios. I bought a book, and it's called The Worst Case Scenario Thinker's Survival Handbook. It's a thing. It's a thing. Actually, it's quite interesting to get it. But one of the things, when I bought the book, I read it. The first thing, one of the first things I read was, you know, how to avoid a charging bull. You never know. Like, you never know. When you pulled up this morning and got out of your car, could have been a charging bull in the parking lot. You just don't know, you know, so you got to be prepared. Worst case scenario. But I thought it was funny, you know. The first thing it said to do, if you encounter a bull that's about to charge you, it says, number one, don't agitate the bull. Fair enough. Uh, that's good. You know, I wasn't planning on going, hey, bull, your mother's a heifer, you know. <laughs> if you weren't a farm person, you might not get that. But, you know, I thought, okay, don't agitate the bull. Second thing, look for an escape route. All right, good book. You know, third thing, run. <laughs> I thought, all right, I think I wasted 10 bucks here, but, you know. So, anyway, worst case scenario thinking. Psychologists call this catastrophizing, catastrophizing. Now, here's the thing. Whatever it is that we're looking for, 
And if we fill our minds, those of you who are especially worst case scenario thinkers, if we are filling our minds with destruction, if we're looking for this, and I'm not saying it's not good to be prepared, you know, but if we're filling our mind with destructive things and we let our minds wander too far down the rabbit hole on this, man, we, we end up finding that which we're looking for. And so scripture talks about that. It says, if you search for good, so if you're looking for the good, if you're, if you're the optimistic person, if you're looking for the good, you'll actually find favor. You'll actually find the blessings of God and find favor in God. But if you search for evil, if your mind is going completely to all the destructiveness, uh, then it will find you. And so we need to speak life into our lives, not destruction. And so this is really important. Now, what I want to say about this series is, first of all, some of you may have come today, even those of you who are negative, you may have come and said, I don't like this series already. <laughs> yeah. This is just a puff and fluff message series, some new age cycle babbling pastor up here, a hippy dippy guy, you know. We need some meat here. We need some, we need some real meat here, not this positivity thinking. It, but I tell you, if, if that's you, if you're negative on that side, uh, one is, I just want to tell you, you're not going on vacation with me. Two, um, that, that's not what this is. Because, because what this is, what I want to do throughout this series, is I want us to take a look at Scripture based not on how we feel, because our feelings can be, uh, they can be misleading to us. I want to base this um, optimistic thinking based on what God says about us because we can trust God's word. So what I'm saying here is it's not, I'm not optimistic based on how I feel. I'm optimistic because of what God says. And, if, and because, our, because our feelings can just betray us, and then, then what we have to do is we have to look at truth. And the, the greatest truth is the word of God. And so what we do is we look at the truth and we say, okay, I'm feeling this way over here. I'm not feeling very optimistic. I'm feeling a little bit negative. I'm feeling like, you know, country's going to hell in a handbasket. I'm feeling like, so I need to look, what does God's word actually say? And this is my truth right here. This is my truth box. I've got to live in this. And so I'm not optimistic based on how I feel. I'm optimistic based on what God says. So what I'm going to do, there's eight, this is an eight-point message. Don't worry, I'm going to get you out in time for your hot dogs. Um, it's an eight-point message, but I'm just going to start sort of, sort of uh, shotgun this thing out there real quick, firecracker this thing out there. I'm just going to pop these eight things out. You don't have to worry about writing them down. If you want to write them down, that's fine. But if you'll remind me, what I'll do is I'll send an email blast out, and this will be another reminder for you to sign up for Constant Contact if you're not on that. But I'll send, I'll send these eight things out as a reminder this week. You just kind of remind me. I will forget between now and then. Just remind me. And, and if you want to get that, I'll email that out this week for the, these eight things with these eight scriptures. But these eight ways, these are eight ways that we can remain optimistic even in a negative world. And they're based on Romans 8. Now, Romans 8 is one of the most weighty, weighty, uh, passages of scripture in all the Bible. It is, it is, it is chock full of, uh, of just great, deep, rich stuff for us. There's more than eight things. Uh, there's about 20 different ways to be optimistic, but I didn't want to do 20 points. I thought eight was enough, and plus it was like, you know, Romans 8, eight things. So you can maybe, anyway, I thought that was good. So the number one way, the number one way to remain optimistic is to know this truth. That I am forgiven. My sins are forgiven. For those of you who have put your hope and trust in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And your eternity is secure. Your eternity is secure. Nobody's going to come and snatch your eternity away from you. Eternity is real. And, and Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Think about this. You are not going to be condemned for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those of you who are, have given your life over to Christ, you believe in Jesus, there's now no longer any condemnation for you. Your sins have been forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. That's what we were singing about today. It set you free from the law of sin and death. Freedom doesn't come without a great price and there's been a great price paid for us right price paid for us to be here without persecution and a price paid for us to have our sins forgiven and to have the hope of eternity 
and eternal life. Now, here's the thing. Once you come to this point of faith, and I, and I don't want to assume that everybody who's watching this online or everybody who's in this room has come to this point, but once you come to this point of faith, once you realize that the Word of God is actually a living, breathing uh, Word of God, this was not written by some you know, three or four or five monks about hundreds of years ago, this was a living, breathing Word of God communicating God's love and redemption plan to us, once we realize that this Bible is not just some man-made religious thing because we're afraid to die, and so we figured out a way to live with this fear, once you figure out that the Bible is actually real, and I'll say this a lot until you guys can start reciting this back to me, once you realize that the Bible actually was created and put together by God over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents in three different languages by 40 different authors, once you realize that this was God's love story, Story and redeeming story to mankind, and it fits together from Genesis to Revelation it's like a glove, prophesying the entire plan of Jesus. Once you kind of come to this point of faith and believing in that, and w- once you realize that, then every nothing else that can happen on this world matters. Not even the fear of dying, because you come to this point that you go. Man, I I realize this is for real. I have a purpose. I have a meaning. This universe is for a purpose. And I am here for a purpose, to be loved and to know God. When you get to that point, when you finally get to that point of belief and you cross over from this agnostic or wondering and you actually go, I believe. I finally believe. I believe this. And, and, and you, you know, once you get there, you kind of then realize, you go, I'm forgiven. And no matter what happens, this life is not all that there is. And that brings so much optimism in your life. Number two, the number two way that I, if I'm starting to get negative or I think about if I'm wanting to gravitate towards negative thoughts, and this is something we don't talk about a lot, although we should. We don't think about this a lot, but we should. Jesus right now is at the right hand of God praying for you. He's praying for you. Think about that. Jesus Christ is praying for you. Romans says, Christ Jesus who died And then Paul says, wait a minute, wait a minute, more than that, more than that, he was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for us. He's interceding for you. And so right now, the way this kind of works, and I don't have all, I don't, look, I don't have all this figured out. I mean, I don't, you know, you you really, we don't really want a God that we can figure the whole thing out, right? We, We have these finite minds with an infinite God. Uh, I can't figure all this out. I don't understand exactly how all this works. And if I did tell you that I figured it out, I'd be worried about following a pastor like that. You know, I don't have all this figured out. But I know that Jesus was God. And I know that God, the Father here, is creator of all universe with Jesus at his right hand. And I know that we are sinners. And I know that God is holy. And Jesus is the, is the interceder between our sin and God's holiness. And so over here, we've got us in this sinful state. And Jesus, because of his sinless state, who, came to, who, came, who left heaven and came to earth, now he intercedes for us. He is that bridge between us and a holy God. And that is Jesus praying and interceding for us to the Father. That is absolutely amazing. When I think about our church, when I think about uh, our, our church here, I think this is one of the prayingest churches that I've been a part of in 30 years, and I absolutely love it. Um, I love that you can fill out, you can, you can, you don't have to just fill this out, but you can talk to somebody too about it, but you can put down here a prayer need or something that's going on in your life, and, and it actually goes to people, and we, we send emails back and forth and say, hey, hey, will you take this issue right here, will you pray for this every single day until we hear something from God on this, you know? And so whatever you have going through, just telling you that it's just not just floating around somewhere on the Internet. There are people praying for whatever you are going through in your life. There's a prayer wall back on the back, and you can write your prayer request down. And people come in. We actually pray for those. We'll, we'll pray over those. Our staff will pray over things. We pray for our church. We pray over specific issues on these things going on. It's why we want to, when we come up here at the end of services, if you have a prayer need, we want to, have somebody up here praying with you, praying through whatever it is that's going on in your 
life. You know, I think about the people in my life that whenever I've had some serious, serious things going on, I call them and say, hey, will you pray over this? Will you, you know, will you pray for this for me? I've got, I've got a couple. I've told you about Jerry Reader. He's the crazy, craziest 83-year-old guy I've ever met in my life. Never met anybody that's wilder uh, and more in love with God except maybe his wife. And, uh, and Jerry used to fly these missions and fly planes, the missionary supplies, were cannibalistic countries all over the globe. I mean, he was just an amazing man of faith. I'd love to have him come and share stories with us sometimes. But his wife is also just an amazing prayer warrior. Whenever I've got something going on in my life, man, I pray. I, I ask her, I say, will you pray for this? And it's like she has a direct connection to God. I mean, it's like those, you know those people that, you know, you, you know if you've got something going on, you want to call them to say, will you pray for this? Will you intercede for me, you know? Because in my mind, I look, I mean, it's God, Jesus, and then Jerry and Ethel, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like they're right up there with God. And so, and so when, I, when I think about that, I'm thinking, okay, Jesus Christ is actually interceding for you and I. He's actually praying for us right now, and that's powerful. The third thing is, my future victory, my future victory is greater than my present pain. My future victory is greater than my present pain. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing. So whatever it is that you're going through or will go through, uh, I consider that our present sufferings, they're not worth comparing to the glory that, we, that will be revealed in us. So again, it, that's not going to happen unless you come to this great point of faith in your life. But once you come to that point of faith, you realize that, hey, this, this pain that I'm going through, it's temporary, doesn't mean anything. It's not even going to compare to the future glory that I have. This is kind of the whole message. If you missed that or just joining us, that was the whole message that we kind of went through in the Habakkuk series over those three weeks in Habakkuk. Number four, uh, my mind is filled. This is how I, this is how I find optimism in a negative world. My mind is filled with the peace of God. My mind is filled with the peace of God, especially for those of you who raised your hand like me and you're a worst case scenario thinker. Don't fill your mind with destructive behaviors and destructive thoughts. Don't fill your mind with that. Fill your mind with the things of God, with the peace of God. The mind governed, Romans says this, the mind, the mind governed by the flesh is death. If your mind is constantly governed by destructive patterns and destructive thoughts, it leads to death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And when I was... Uh, when I was 25, I, I've told this to you guys, and I'll use this illustration a lot because it's just, it's just very impactful in my life, and uh, it's an experience that I went through that, that I grew out of and, and, and grew through. But when I was 25, and uh, my dad was dying of cancer, every bump and bruise I had during that time, I thought, well, that's it. I'm, I'm dead. That's it. I got cancer, you know. And I, I just went through this period of time. Maybe you guys, if, if you've had to struggle with that or you, you've dealt with that, maybe you've had to wrestle with that too. Like, you know, well, you think you've got cancer every time you turn around or you think you've got something going on every time you turn around. And so, beep, 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 beep. Thank you, Marilyn, for doing that because I was really negative about that <laughs> beeping that was going on. But I was dealing with that. I was, I was saying that, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was, um, I, was uh, I get distracted really easy like that. All it took is a little beep, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> don't, <laughs> so, so here's the thing. Here's the thing that my, my uh, friend told me, my pastor friend told me when I was going through all this. He goes, look, don't speak death and destruction in your life. Speak the things that are worthy of God. Make that what you're speaking into your life. And that changed me. I'm not there yet. I'm a, I have a long way to go. But, but that, cha that thought process changed me. So now if my mind is going to destructive patterns, I'm going, okay, I want to rely not on my feelings. My feelings will betray me. What does God say? God says, I am loved. I am cared for. He has plans not to harm me, but to prosper me. So I focus on those things that can be positive. Number five, we sing about this. Uh, if God is for me, who can be against me? If God is for us, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge 
against those whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. If God is for us, who can be against us? And here's the thing. God is for you. And I don't even need to say anything else. If God, is, if God is in our corner, if God is in our corner, we don't need anything else. If God is for us, nothing can be against you. Number six, God's spirit helps me in my weakness. Uh, Romans says, Paul says, who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. And it seems like, seems like everything I'm, reading here when you give your life over to christ the holy spirit begins to work differently in your life and the holy spirit becomes and works in your life as the comforter that's actually one of the names for the holy spirit he comforts us and gives us strength during the weakest moments of our life even and i think going back even talking about my dad a little further before my dad died he asked me to preach his funeral for him that was a weighty and heavy thing to do and uh, if my dad knew the pain that that would have caused me, he probably wouldn't have even asked me to do that, but he did. And so I wanted to honor him, and so I got up in front of, you know, three, 400 people and all, family and friends, and, and, uh, and I began to share. I was trying to minister to people when, honestly, the truth is I needed to be ministered to. Um, I didn't need to be up there, really, because I, I was a wreck, and I was torn up. I couldn't get through it, kind of like what Sonia was talking about. I had a meltdown, and I, and I just completely... I just completely lost it on the stage and couldn't go on any further, almost to the point where I was going to have people come up. And, 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 and I can't explain it. I don't know completely how this happened, but it was you could just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit came over in such a powerful way. It doesn't always happen this way, but in this moment, it was like such a powerful moment and a powerful expression of God's Holy Spirit actually taking on that form and being the comforter. And I was able to stand up and go through. I don't have a clue what I said, but I was able to stand up and go through because I think that in the moment of our weakest moments, God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes in as our comforter and works in our lives in our weakness. Number seven, God is working everything in my life for good, Romans 8 says. And we know that in all things, you know what the Greek translation for all means? All. You're right. <laughs> And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Again, it kind of seems like he's working in a different way. He's working in a different way in our lives. The way I see it in Scripture, he's working in a different way in our lives for those who have put their hope and trust in Jesus. For those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, this doesn't mean that once you give your life to Christ, that all of a sudden everything's going to be good and it's going to happen the way that you want it to happen. There's not going to be any problems, no more challenges. You're going to ride off in the sunset on your steed with your, you know, whatever. It's not going to happen that way, no. But we do know this, that God, God can, is, specializes in taking something that was intended for bad or intended for evil. He specializes in redeeming that and bringing it about, bringing it about face in, for something good that will happen. You know, and that's what God specializes in. Once I realized that, that something good can come out of something absolutely terrible that was meant for evil, that was meant for destruction, and God can spin that around because he specializes in redemption. Even with his son Jesus, we see that. All right, number eight. I'll wrap this up. Number eight, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Think about this. Paul says, for I am convinced. He's come to this great point of faith. He says, now, now I'm actually convinced of this. It took me a while. You know, it took me persecuting even Christians. I was making fun of Christians. But now Paul says, I'm actually, I'm absolutely 100% convinced of this. That whether I live, whether I live or die through this, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. You know, we, Paul had some thorn going on in his flesh. We don't even know what that was. We, we have no idea what that was, but we assume that it was some kind of a medical thing. And, and so Paul, and it's not like Paul didn't have things going on in his life. You may go, well, but Paul didn't have to deal with the thing. No, Paul dealt with a lot. You know, he dealt with persecution. He dealt with being stripped and flogged and beaten and tarred and feathered. And he dealt with shipwrecked. He dealt with, with uh, snake bites. He dealt with being in chains because of his faith, you know. So we don't have anything to complain about compared to Paul, you know. So Paul, he's going, but I'm convinced that whether I live through this or whether I die. He's going, I'm convinced of this. Neither the angels or the demons. 
we don't talk about that a lot because people get weirded out and you start talking about angels and demons. But angels and demons are all throughout Scripture. We should probably talk about them more often because they, it's a real thing, you know. But we just don't, we just don't talk about it. But he goes, neither angels nor demons. I mean, the power of angels, the power of demons. No, neither the present, not, not, not what's going on right now, not, not the present or anything that's going to happen in the future. Whatever powers outside of this power of my, or out, outside of the power of God, nothing. Neither height nor depth. Another, whether I'm on the mountaintop experience and I'm feeling so connected to God or, or I'm in the lowest, deepest, darkest valley in my life, nothing. Nothing in all of creation, he says, nothing will be able to separate me and to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. When we get to that point, man, we can live with optimistic thinking. Again, not, not being uh, betrayed by our uh, emotions and the way that we feel, but we come back to the Word of God. That's why it's so important for us to be found in the Word of God. I encourage you to read Romans 8 this week and just make that a part of your daily reading every week. We're going to continue to layer this thing out and to build on this so that by the end of these six weeks, it's not just all about optimism, but it's about the things that we're going to layer in and build in that will allow you to feel more optimistic and more confident, more enthusiastic in what God is doing. I know we live in a negative world right now. We do. We got some things we got to deal with as a culture. We do. And we don't want to be Christians that are just sticking our head in the sand and we're walking around going, oh, everything's just great because I'm happy and I'm positive. We don't want to, that's not, that's not what we're intending to do here either. We want to address those things. We want to deal with those things. We want to wrestle with those things. But we want to rest and know and rely on the promises of God that he's given us in his word. That we can live confident in knowing whose and whom we are in Jesus Christ. All right. So why don't you stand, let's pray, and then you guys can go celebrate with your hot dogs and hamburgers today. If you, uh, if you want some extra prayer today, i uh, love to pray with you. We'll have our prayer team, our elders up here to your left. If you're coming today, um, you want to talk about, you know, hey, I really want to get involved in the church here, or kind of want to serve here. What, what does that look like or what does it mean? Um, we we'll talk to you. We kind of call it the next steps area. What's, what's my next step? And so I'll be back in the back on the left on the, in the room back there uh, for next steps on your way out. I'd love to talk with you and just uh, shake your hand and meet you this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for encouraging us in our weakness. Uh, thank you for your promises that we can look to even when our emotions betray us, even when our thoughts betray us, even when we're thinking negative thoughts and, and we can look at your word and we know that we are a child of the king and truly nothing else matters. Because you called us your own. And God, we can stand in that promise. We can stand on that promise. And, and God, we, we thank you for that. Father, I pray that for our church, I pray for myself in this and for everyone in the room that when we look at our culture, when we see the negativity and we see destruction and we see that, yeah, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. We'll do what we can to minister through it, but we won't lose our hope and that we'll keep our hope and our eyes fixed on you, Jesus. Uh, because that's it, where everything lies for us in our lives. And so I pray, pray this over our church too, God, that we would spend this time really leaning into your word and, and understanding and knowing the promises that you have for us. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen.